Hello everybody, my name is David Pang. I am a consultant in pain management and I work at Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital in London, the UK. And I want to thank the Children's Tumour Foundation for giving this opportunity for me to talk at this webinar and I hope you'll find what I'm going to say helpful. So for the next half an hour, I'm going to give a overview about pain, the sort of impact pain has on patients with schwannomatosis, how then we classify pain, and then what can we do to help our patients, and then at the end to explore a few avenues for how we can do things a little bit better. So my background is in anesthesia but these days I focus pretty much all my attention on pain management and especially on managing patients who've got long-term intractable pain either caused by conditions that are known but uncurable or by conditions that we don't know but we've excluded major significant pathology. Now, most of my work is focused on adults, especially with musculoskeletal pain, because that's the most common condition. However, I do a regular clinic with Professor Ros Ferner at Guy's Hospital, who I've been working with for probably the past eight years or so to try and help some of the patients with NF and especially schwannomatosis find ways to deal with their pain better and try to minimise the disability that's associated with their pain. Now, one of the things that's different when pain becomes more long-term and chronic, and this applies especially to patients with neurofibromatosis, schwannomatosis, is that it's not quite as straightforward as a simple sensation. So it's quite common to see patients, despite a tumour burden that doesn't seem to be significant have quite persistent and disabling pain and this pain quite varies it's not always a constant intensity that they can predict quite often it can be random it can come on when it's unexpected and it's very usual for patients to get episodes where the pain flares up and it can take quite a while of quite varying duration before it settles down. And this leads to quite a lot of significant disability, not just from the physical functional side, but from the emotional and psychological side either. And we'll explore this a little bit later. Now to illustrate a point, this is a chap who came to see us a few years ago and he had a tumour affecting his sciatic nerve and this was quite resistant to a lot of medical treatments all the painkillers didn't work he tried lots of physio he'd seen psychologists uh, he had some debulking to the tumour but they couldn't quite remove it and he was left with quite a lot of disability and for many years he wasn't really making much progress so he was referred to our centre to see if there's anything we can do to help him now when he came to us, this was how he was able to walk. And you can see quite an unsteady gait. He almost looks like he's going to fall okay, do you want to hang it on for just and a sec, please? Really, to walk to the end of the corridor and back took a considerable amount of time and effort. So I'm going to let you just dwell on this sort of imagery for a little while to see and this is quite a typical um, sort of patients that we see we often get by the time they come to a lot of pain services they often do have a significant amount of physical disability and deconditioning now he's given us permission to show you these um, videos 
and I'll explain a bit later what we did to try and help him and the outcomes. So in the past, pain was just treated as a symptom of some underlying problem. So it was more important to treat the cause of the pain and we give them a little bit of analgesia to make them a bit more comfortable. Now we're realizing that actually the pain itself can cause a very significant health burden and a very low quality of life. And many of our patients with chronic pain have quality of life indices as low as we'd find in stroke, nerve injuries, trauma, and severe cardiovascular and neuromuscular diseases. So despite it being almost an invisible symptom for many people, it actually has a big impact on their lives. So coming back to schwannomatosis, now this was a study from coming at almost 10 years ago now, um, but still has quite a lot of validity. Um, and it shows that almost two thirds of patients suffer from chronic pain. And of that, about 18% are disabled severely by it. So these are patients that often will consume quite a lot of healthcare resources. They would struggle to get to work. They would have quite a big impact on relationships, their mood and overall quality of life. And the thing about pain in schwannomatosis is it often has quite an unusual quality. It's not a typical pressure pain that you probably would expect if you've got a tumour pressing on another part of your body. Many of these patients often describe quite diffuse symptoms, pain that extends beyond where the symptoms are, and also pain that can be quite episodic. And this makes it quite hard when we try and measure pain in that if you give them, if you tell them one day, if you catch them on a day where it's not too bad, you may not capture the overall extent of how severe it is. And sometimes the patients do get quite frustrated when, especially when they come and see health professionals. Inevitably, you end up seeing them when the pain isn't too bad and their concerns can be dismissed. Now, for many of these patients, the pain doesn't respond particularly well to analgesic drugs. And I'll talk a little bit about these a bit later on. So what do we do if these patients have ongoing pain and yet we don't actually have a curative procedure that can remove the tumour or debulk it so that it causes less of a symptom burden. What if these patients have been told, look, there's, a not, there's not a lot we can do about it. We still have to find ways for them to manage, manage pain, especially since it does have quite a big impact on their lives. So for a lot of my patients, medical therapies have been exhausted. By the time they come to a lot of pain services, a lot of the conventional treatments have been tried. define it. So I'm going to take you to this little case that was published in the British Medical Journal in 95 in the section in the back called Minerva which was the bit where I always like to read because it always had quite a lot of interesting little case studies and you didn't need a lot, you didn't need a high attention span to make the most of it and this is one that um, was standing out because it involved how the kind of experience of how we manage pain. So a 29 year old builder had jumped onto a large nail and you can see from the photos that it went through his foot and every time the nail was moved he cried out in pain. So he had to be sedated for 
anything to be done. Now, this is quite a sort of understandable presentation, and we can all imagine seeing this sort of patient, and you wouldn't really think this was unusual. However, what stood out was that when they actually took the boot off and took the nail out, the nail actually didn't enter any part of the foot that went between the toes. So there was actually no reason why this should be painful. And yet, the pain that he perceived was very, very real. So this brings me to the next slide, which is the definition of pain. So pain isn't just a collection of signals from the periphery of the brain. It's not a sensation on its own. And this is the international definition that we use as pain specialists. And if you look at this, the key things here are it's a sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage. So in other words, pain is actually what our patients perceive it is. It doesn't necessarily have to be associated with injury to the body itself. We kind of tend to perceive pain as a sensation and as a mechanism to protect ourselves. But in some circumstances, it doesn't work that way. There is no physiological or adaptive component to it. And when it becomes maladaptive, this is then when we get involved as health professionals. One of the things that we do get puzzled at is why is there a disconnect between the pathology that we see physically and the pain itself and the impact of pain? Which leads us to think that pain isn't a particularly reliable biomarker for severity of disease. This next slide shows the opposite. This is a patient who's got NF who walked into my clinic. He's got a bit of a backache, but he still works full time. He comes in without much of a walking aid. His posture is a little bit odd, but this is what you see in the x-ray. He's got a very significant scoliosis and you can see it extends all the way to the side and then back into the middle. Now, you'd think that he would be in a huge amount of pain, but he actually manages quite well. I gave him a, a, a small TENS machine and I haven't seen him for a long time. He just manages it. He comes back occasionally to get some spare pads and that's it. So when we look at pain, we look at pain not just as a purely sensory, but we see that it has a very personal experience that has a lot of physical and non-physical influences. Um, the signals that send pain and how we perceive it are completely diff are different phenomena. And most of us will learn about pain as we go through our lives. So what we knew in the past does not necessarily mean what's going to happen as we age and learn. And this is quite an important factor because it does mean that pain can change and how we react to pain can change depending on our approaches. And the fourth point is that really we do need to respect many of our patients' pain, what they say. A very common phrase that I get is that they just don't feel their pain is believed. And while the pain itself um, is, is important, it can have adverse effect on disability, physical, emotional function, and, and then when it does become maladaptive is when the role of the health professional can become very important. And the last one here is that while expression of pain is quite often verbal, it doesn't really necessarily mean that 
pain isn't there if they can't express. And this is quite important for younger children and patients who have got cognitive difficulties. And overall, this is a diagram that takes a lot of these things in to together. So you can see that the pain experience in the middle, and it's affected by biological, cognitive or psychological factors, as well as the environment, especially its social factors. And we call this the biopsychosocial model. And this is something that we use in, in chronic pain as the basis of all our approaches and therapies. And it's a model that's used in other specialties as well. So the next few slides, we're going to talk a little bit about how pain is modulated at different areas in the nervous system. And that gives you an explanation about why it can vary between individuals. So here at the peripheries, if you've got ongoing inflammation and injury, you can cause an increased sensitization, which can be quite prolonged with through the pain receptive field. And that's manifest in pain being of a longer duration and of a wider area. And I want to sort of move away from our thinking that pain was a sort of passive neural circuit. But what we see is pain coming through the ascending pathways can actually have a number of gates and filters where second order and higher neurons can affect the actual signals going through. And it's this balance of signals from both inhibitory as well as excitatory neurons that will determine how much pain that we perceive. And you can see on this next slide a number of different areas where pain can be modulated. And this is evident here where a high number of pain afferents will only output to a small number of spinal output neurons. So a lot of processing occurs even before we reach any higher centers. And what we're noticing a bit more now is actually pain isn't regulated just by neuronal cells, but by non-nervous system tissues, especially the cells involved in immunology and inflammation and a large amount of work on glial cells and supportive cells are starting to open our eyes to how pain can be sensitized regulated and perpetuated by these supporting structures so what this leads to is a concept called central sensitization where noxious input which is repeated, can actually start to amplify the pain response. And now normally this is an adaptive physiological process. So the body doesn't really want you to ignore pain. And if you try and ignore it, it gets louder and louder. So central sensitization normally is short-lived. And once the stimulus or pathology resolves it regresses but when it becomes more long term you've now then developed a pain processing system that is amplified and this is what we believe to be a significant reason why some of our patients develop chronic persistent pain now the mechanisms about why it doesn't shut off isn't fully understood but we have seen a number of potential mediators affecting nervous system, glial cells, and cells of the inflammatory system, which affect the nervous system, especially at spinal and perhaps even higher centers. And, and we can see this phenomenon in the laboratory, and it's of quite an intense area of research where we're going to try and find molecular mediators of sensitization that we can target as therapy. And one example you see here is NMDA receptor, which we use ketamine 
as an analgesic target but so far that's only been useful for short-term pain and less useful for pain that's long-term due to the risk of addiction and side effects. Now the psychological and cognitive aspect of pain have been crucial in how we develop better long-term strategies to manage and most pain management centers have a psychologist attached to it for a very good reason in that pain isn't just managed physically but also many of our patients benefit from utilizing a cognitive approach but one of the biggest barriers is still this perception that pain is all in my head but once they are able to overcome these unhelpful beliefs they can see a lot of improvements and we see from the neurobiology at higher centers and from studies such as functional MRI that the cognitive and higher as aspects of pain are extremely important. So what this means is that pain, because it's more than just a sensation and it's an experience, it may not always correlate with the magnitude of pathology and I'm hopefully able to start to convince you about this important concept. And again, just putting this slide up, just to reiterate the importance of non-physical, non-biological factors in chronic pain. So when we assess many of our patients, it's not just about asking about the pain itself. Um, what we do when pain becomes long-term, we start to look at the actual impact of pain on physical function, psychological well-being and also quality of life so measurements of pain intensity quality can be done with a simple four-point scale mild moderate severe or no pain or you can use a numerical scale naught to ten naught is none ten is the worst pain possible Another way to do it is to use a analog scale where the left is no pain, the right is the worst, and they just put a little mark to see where they think their pain is. This can also be used as a, another visual manner using faces, which is especially useful in children. And for those children that are less able to communicate, we can use behavioural or even physiological scales, although they are less effective and not as accurate. Now, measurements of physical function can be done on questionnaires that the patients fill in, or we can use that actual outcome measures where we look at, say, how far they can walk, movements of the joints, etc. The psychological well-being, emotional function is pretty much all done by self-reporting. And there's a number of questionnaires that can do this. Now, one of the issues about having a lot of these questionnaires to, is to try and find something that is quite straightforward in clinical practice without becoming too much of a burden for patients. And in a research setting, we've usually got plenty of time to do a lot of these questionnaires, but in a busy clinic, that's not always possible. And hopefully with the help of electronic medical records in the future, this will become an easier task. So global measures can be also useful, especially when we're following patients up, as they are a little bit less likely to be influenced by day-to-day -day variation. So the next few slides are looking at specific types of pain that we see. We try to phenotype pain, not by the cause of it, but by some of its mechanisms. Now, this is the most common pain that people see. Uh, we call it nociceptive pain, and it's a typical pain that you'd expect to see if you have tissue injury, trauma, or discernible pathology. Neuropathic pain is the other phenotype, and this is something we probably see a bit more in schwannomatosis, and this describes those pains that are caused by disorders of the nervous system. And quite often patients describe these pains as quite an unusual sensation, not the typical dull ache, but more of a shooting 
hot, cold, electrical shock. Sometimes they feel dysesthetic symptoms such as crawling under the skin or areas where it's super sensitive. Now, quite often patients even struggle to, to describe this pain because it does feel quite unusual. And many patients feel that because it's hard to describe, they get concerned that people won't believe them. And one of the properties about this pain is that it responds extremely poorly to standard analgesics. And when patients do have it, it is associated with a worse quality of life. Now, most recently, there's been a third classification, something called nociplastic pain. And this is pain that arises despite no real evidence of actually any dysfunction of the nervous system or evidence of tissue injury. So in other words, those pains that don't belong in the first two groups. And this is the pain that we think is significantly influenced by central sensitization states. And examples of these pains are those widespread pains you see in fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, bladder pain syndrome. And what's, what's interesting is that not, these pains are often viewed with suspicion by many of us in the medical profession. And that's not a surprise given that part of the definition involves no easily discernible physical pathology. And quite often patients develop not only the pain itself, they actually feel other areas where they're a bit more sensitized and they have an associated fatigue, cognitive dysfunction and other non-specific symptoms. And this is a little algorithm that can be quite useful in determining whether nociplastic pain exists. And one of the important things is that while nociplastic pain um, can coexist with all the other types of pain, nociceptive and neuropathic, much like pseudo seizures can exist alongside true epilepsy. So the next part of the talk is going to be what can we do to help manage our patients and the three main things are trying to reduce how much pain they have to then rehabilitate them from a physical and psychological perspective and then to target mechanisms which may amplify and make the pain stronger than it really is and the best way to do that is to adopt a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary approach again recognition of pain that many of our patients in is the first step. So the ideal situation would be to take the pain away completely but it's not always possible and commonly if say a curative surgery isn't possible we often adopt initially a pharmacological approach. Now almost two-thirds of our patients are resorted to using analgesia with a median number of three and that probably tells you that it's not particularly effective and you can see the different classes of analgesics that are available and one of the problems is that despite a huge amount of research in developing new drugs we haven't really seen any breakthroughs for many many years but one of the things that we do see is the adverse effect of drugs such as opioids where it has been attributed to increase in mortality without really much an improvement in how pain is managed overall. So the bottom line is that medications can be quite helpful if you are using it as part of a plan but not they're not really there as a standalone therapy unless it's for short term. So how do we target some of these central mechanisms of pain? Because one of the things is that if you have a high degree of central sensitization, a lot of the biological treatments simply won't work or they are associated with a lot of adverse effects. And one of the starters is looking at lifestyle measures. And this is, a, in some ways, this could 
the emotion, not just for pain, but actually for health in general. But we kind of focus this on pain-related lifestyle issues, patient education and supportive care. And what's important is the specific cognitive approaches that we use. And it's quite important that these are applied with an experienced psychologist that is, ex is recognising the particular approaches that chronic pain requires. One of the models we use is something called acceptance and commitment therapy, or ACT. And instead of looking at trying to change people's beliefs, but more of looking at how we can focus on those the beliefs that are helpful and the value-based rather than goal-based approach. And this is a slide that encompasses some of the principles of this type of approach. So I think in the future, there's quite a lot of avenues where research can really help find better treatments for patients, especially looking at different types of therapies. As you've seen before, the drugs don't seem to play a big role, but we haven't had any new ones for a long time. How can we improve our knowledge of pain and schwannomatosis so that we can tailor specific therapies to this group rather than adopt the general approach? And the third one is, can we find any better pain biomarkers and outcome measures? After all, everything we measure is subjective. I'm going to spend the next few slides talking about this therapy, which is something that has only been available recently, which is the use of spinal cord stimulation and electrical fields to manage pain. They can be very useful for those patients who've got a significant neuropathic component. And in the past, we weren't able to do this for this group of patients because they weren't MRI compatible. But now this restriction is no longer a problem. And what this involves is using small cylindrical electrodes placed so in the posterior column of the spine so that the electrical fields emitted by them can actually activate inhibitory circuits within the spinal cord and reduce pain. Now this is a treatment that's been pioneered in the 60s and so it's nothing new but it may be something that will be quite useful in this group of patients in the future now that MRI is no longer an issue. And this is an example of a lady who's got a tumour around the sciatic nerve who I implanted eight electrodes to the posterior column. And this was probably about seven or eight years ago now, and she's doing very well. So lots of exciting work on new receptors, especially in the peripheries, looking at transient receptor potential vanilloid and looking at specific sodium channel antagonists. So sodium channel 1.7, 8 and 9 are specific channels which mediate nociception. And other markers such as nerve growth factor where they play a role in nociceptor development as well as their functioning have been very promising targets. And Here's a paper which shows that taking samples of fluid from painful schwannomas can increase sensitization at the nerve root and dorsal root ganglion level. And this is mediated by the TRIP-V1 receptor. So how do we put this all together? And what we believe is the best approach is using a multidisciplinary pathway which draws professionals from different fields and this is reflected by the fact that pain is a multi-dimensional quality so having a single clinician manage pain isn't really considered a standard of care anymore and I think the best outcome comes with coordination between lots of different disciplines and to illustrate that do you remember this chap who struggled to walk and and I kind of showed you a little bit about the sort of physical function that he had when he came to see us in the beginning.
first managed to improve a lot of his physical function as well as his emotional state, which unfortunately you can't see on this slide, by adopting an approach which involves both physical, psychological rehabilitation, as well as managing his medications and his values. a comprehensive assessment to starting initial treatments and then for those ones which are more refractory becoming more multidisciplinary. So just to conclude pain isn't a single sensory phenomenon but actually an experience with many different dimensions and it's influenced by not only biological factors but also psychological and social issues and if we don't manage our patients well they come with quite significant disability but we have a lot of work on trying to get better treatments markers and ways to measure outcomes so this is the final slide i want to apologize for being slightly over but thank you very much for listening Hello everyone and welcome David, thank you for your lecture. Uh, we are now entering the Q&A session. Uh, we, siamo nella nostra... ...who don't ask questions, so I will start myself with a question for you. Um, wh wh one of the... Uh, wh 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 my understanding is... Um, oh, there's a question coming uh, from Nicole Zimmerman. Uh, yes, we apologize for the technical glitch. Uh, everyone's screen, everyone's screen froze. Uh, but um, can can you explain, um, uh, David, what treatment was used with the man at the end? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, sorry about that. Do you want to actually see the video? I can show you and share my screen just very briefly, if you want, so you can actually see how effective the treatment yes. was. Hannah, is this possible? Would I be able to do that? Oh, it's disabled. Um, but what to, to answer the to answer the question? Um, so this was a chap that had um, a lot of not only physical pain, but he actually had a lot of pain related disability. So it affected him both in his daily um, activities, even dressing, dr um, walking, and it had quite an emotional impact on him. So what we did was we focused with our specialist physios on working, not just to give him some exercise, he's had all of that, but on actually trying to work out what are the barriers that stopped him from, say, walking, moving. And we found out a lot of it turned out to be cognitive and psychological barriers. He had a lot of guilt because he wanted to join the armed forces. He saw his friends die in Afghanistan. That had a big knock-on effect on his mental and then physical function. So a lot of our therapists, which are the physios and psychologists, worked on a lot of that. And again, using the principles of acceptance and commitment fair so we focused on one getting him to accept some of the issues that he felt was um, treatable and and move on to something not to cure the underlying condition he can't do that but to say right i've got this can i um release some of the strategies to actually deal better with the pain is it the pain that's stopping me or is it the actual belief that the pain's stopping me, which is quite a crucial component? So we didn't use any medical treatments for him. He, he tried all of that. He tried all the drugs, injections. He'd had surgery. He'd even had a spinal stimulator. But even the but what we got him to do was to face a lot of the cognitive challenges, and that's what um, that's what turned things around. <clears throat> Thank you. Um... We have a question which I understand comes comes from a French patient, so I would ask you to uh, calibrate your answer accordingly. Um, 
uh, Catherine asks, uh, says that uh, the, the, the episodic pain that they can experience, that patients can experience, uh, um, is, is traumatic. Uh, this is the word she uses. Um, and this seems to, 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 um, um, to lead to an attitude of, of protection of avoidance. Um, and she wondered if this question has, was studied in, in, in trinomatosis at all. Um, very good question. And something we see commonly, not only just in schwannomatosis, but many other pain conditions. And quite often when we look at pain, it's not a fixed state where the pain is like this. It goes up and down. And it's and a lot of our patients describe these episodic pains, and they can be very very difficult to to manage because in between you're fine. Quite often, when you see your doctors, you're at a time when the pain is not as bad, and so it leads to many people not believing you. Um, but the the approach we use is still the same. What we find difficult is trying to measure how do we measure this episodic pain, and we haven't quite worked that out yet and what we've relied on is not using the direct pain measures but the measures on how it affects you um, physically and mentally and, and talking talking about the scales that are actually uh, able to uh, to assess this kind of impact on people's lives um, do you think that they would need to be adapted uh, somehow for schwannomatosis pain or are there existing pain scales? Uh, and I'm talking, I'm not talking about intensity. I'm talking about quality of life and, and impact on, on, uh, on, uh, on physical and emotional functioning ones, uh, that would actually, uh, that, that would actually work for schwannomatosis. Um, yes, another good and quite difficult question. I think the standard pain scale isn't good enough where we measure a pain intensity quite often 0 to 10 or mild, moderate, severe. And what we'd like to, what I think would be more useful is a scale that has a number of components incorporating pain, function, and emotional aspects. Now, having a specific one for schwannomatosis. I think would be quite difficult because we'd have to try and validate it in, in some ways to make sure that, say, when one patient measures the pain, it's the same or it's consistent between patients and other conditions. So my view is perhaps what we need to do is define the existing scales and seeing how well that relates to our patients' quality of life and global measures and if that is, if we find something satisfactory, we should use them just because we can then also use it as a general measure when, we, when we're doing clinical research. If not, then developing a scale will be the next step, but that will be quite a significant undertaking. But it might be useful if we need to, we develop like a spronomatosis sort of pain, what we call a composite scale. We'd have to have a number of measures and have a single score at the end. And regarding this first step of actually validating existing scales for schwannomatosis pain, which would be the first step towards actually having having pain scales uh, uh, that, that 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 measure the, the, the you know the impact on quality of life, uh, how many? Because we have anecdotal, uh, I have anecdotal uh, what what I consider anecdotal reports on what pain in schwannomatosis is from different centres. who we see very few patients, of course, because the, the disease is so rare. Uh, but how many patients do you think we would need to gather uh, in order to to do a proper validation study? Ooh. <laughs> Another very difficult question. Is, I think as a preliminary start, you probably need at least 30, 40 patients. 30, 40 patients. Yeah. yeah. And um, it's, it's not easy. The, the difficulty, however, of validating any pain measurements is there, is that, there isn't really a gold standard. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. You're depending a lot on um, in experiences and what we call surrogate outcomes. So you, you're kind of marking it along quality of life. 
another subject. You're measuring a subjective measurement against another one. So what we call validation is actually more of a semi-valid semi-validation. It's, it's sure. never quite as it's never perfect. Sure. Uh, we have another question from Nicole Zimmerman, um, who thanks you. And she says, uh, you mentioned ketamine. Are we looking at ketamine therapy to help with emotional and physical pain with an F? Ah, um, yes, I did mention that. It's, it's a drug that's used more for inpatients just because of the side effects. I don't use it uh, as, an, as, an, as, a, as an analgesic at all in, in an outpatient setting, except near the, uh, when people are palliative. Um, it does have both um, emotional effects on pain as well as a physical, but I just think that for the emotional impact, you need to use it more long term. So it's not as useful for that. It's quite useful for those patients who've got a lot of um, neuropathic pains and those patients that have developed a lot of tolerance to other analgesics such as opioids, gabapentinoids, etc., because it works on a very different mechanism. Um, so there is some promising work on looking at emotional pain using cannabis extracts, but that's still in a very experimental stage. It looks like those sorts of drugs might be, um, they work on the emotional side of pain than the physical side. So you see a few anecdotal um, reports where they can work very well, but ketamine, the, the while it can work on the emotional, it's it, the, the side effect profile is just too too great for something long term. Um, thank you, uh, David. Um, I have another question myself. Um, uh, I wondered if, if if in your experience as a pain specialist, uh, is there another you know painful disease that actually somehow relates to schonomatosis where well, you think that the patients may be experiencing the same kind of pain? Ooh, um, the nearest pains are those ones which are more neuropathic. And the, the problem is it's not, it's, it's not easy to find because the schonomatosis patients are quite unique. Their pains are very, very episodic and quite paroxysmal. It, it just has no reason. The only nearest one I can think of are those patients that have um, severe neuromas and phantom limb pain, not in the nature in that you don't get a phantom sensation, but in the fact that the pain comes on and off and it's in, it can be entirely random and unprovoked. And again, another um, type of pain which is very resistant to conventional treatments and we focus on not curing the pain, but finding a way to help our patients manage and deal with it. And again, how, how do you think, because I've got, again, anecdotal, uh, anecdotal um, reports of, you know, the pain, pain in schonomatosis patients being mostly of a neuropathic nature. Can you confirm this? Or, and how, you know, how, how important do you think is this nociplastic kind of pain in schonomatosis? Um, I, I agree. I think the primary reason for pain is neuropathic. And there's no, um, I don't think there's much doubt on that. And also, also the pathology itself um, lends itself, um, makes, it, makes, it, makes it perfectly valid. The nociplastic components is a more recent concept. Now, we've all seen it before where the pain from one area starts to spread and becomes, becomes affects other parts of the limb it starts to affect the whole, in some ways, the sensitization of the, of the whole body. That comes later, especially when pain isn't well treated or when the pain is treated with single modalities, such as medication alone. And what happens is that the patients become cognitively too focused on their pain, and then it starts to overwhelm them. Now, yeah. This is all anecdotal because it's still a very sort of recent concept. But I think in the beginning, nociplastic pain probably plays very little role for patients with schronomatosis. But 
later on when the pain becomes less well controlled it takes on a greater component and, and both of them can coexist which takes us to um a very tough question from catherine again the the french patient um <clears throat> who asked whether there's, there's ever been a um a study made post-mortem on a patient that, that would link uh, the you know the 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 the, the schonomatosis pain to uh, to or, or another illness to, to suicide in in patients that have you know have committed suicide uh, have there any post-mortem uh, post-mortem analysis done uh, studies been done on these as far as you know? um not as far as i know i do know of one post-mortem study on a different pain condition which is complex regional pain syndrome where patients get a mixture of neuropathic and nociceptive pain and what's quite interesting is that it shows um, even though the pain is outside the central nervous system uh, what the central nervous system develops is a high degree of um, glial formation and this is a topic over the last 10, 15 years that a lot of pain specialists have become really interested in. Um, so with chronic pain, it affects the um, some of the glia, especially the microglia in the spinal cord. And you can see some of that in some of the studies with uh, radioactive markers such as TSPO, where you can see the increased activity. So this is one of those areas of research which is still in the basic science but maybe something promising in the future and uh, i see no other questions so i come up with my own as usual <laughs> but then they come up um you say that mri is no longer a restriction when it comes to um studying pain in patients but really in practical terms is it is it not a restriction still? I mean, um, well, what I talked about with the MRI was with the neurostimulators. So, in the past, those ones weren't compatible. But MRI, um, that's that technical issue is now being overcome. Now, the use of MRI for pain is actually a very fascinating question because what they were using it more and more now MRI obviously can't diagnose pain but we're getting some more evidence that um, looking at some of the functional MRI studies we can see certain patterns of pain and areas of blood flow that can kind of suggest certain areas of the brain um, light up with a particular pattern we're not quite there yet with getting the biomarker unfortunately so we can't use it to say you've got pain you don't have pain but what we're looking at is exploring different areas of the nervous system that seem to be more important in regulating the pain. Those are the areas which we may be able to target with non-invasive treatments like um, magnetic um, transcranial stimulation, which is another promising therapy. I didn't really have time to mention this in the slides, I'm afraid. Yes, because all, all these therapies would require, you know, the, the patient traveling to the clinic. Uh, this is what I meant by practical terms. I mean, um, also, uh, just to have an idea, my understanding is that you work in the London NF Center, which to where, because of how the system works in England, uh, most of the patients that live in southern England are directed to. Um, can you give us an idea of how many uh, uh, non-NF2 schwannomatosis patients you see every month? Um, I see, I mean, I generally I just see the ones that require significant pain input. And um, I do a, a monthly clinic with the team. I also get patients referred just to my general clinic in case they need to be seen more urgently. And I probably see about two or three every month, which is very little, considering you're 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 overseeing half of the country, mostly. That's right. A Actually. lot of the times, yeah. I mean, a lot of times I get informal referrals for or for advice from the team. I don't physically see them, but I, I physically see just a small number every month. 
Well, thank you. I think I have run out of questions, and so as the audience, apparently. I wondered if, you, if, if there was something, you know, that during our conversation that popped up that you may want to, to deepen or, 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 or talk about. Well, I want to say um, thank you for everyone and for inviting me. Um, I think the issues about pain in schwannomatosis are of a more, it's, it's nice to see that the, um, the Tumor Foundation and actually the, the neurofibromatosis community is paying a lot of attention to this. because so I think this is something that many of the patients do sort of say is a problem with pain, but in the past, a lot of the clinicians have said, oh, it's okay, just here's some painkillers, off you go. And we're getting a, it's really nice to get a conversation about dealing with pain management and focusing research on actually making something that could potentially um, make a great deal of improvements to our patient's quality of life, rather than just the size of their pathology or what their tumors look like. So I'm, re I'm really encouraged by that, and I hope to be of help in the future to the schwannomatosis community. Thank you very, very much, David, uh, for having us, uh, for having, uh, for, for this lecture and for your, for sharing all your experience uh, uh, with the schwannomatosis patients with us today. So uh, the, um, um, unless there are some burning other questions which I don't see coming up in the chat, uh, the webinar is over for today. I hope everyone enjoyed it. And uh, thank you to the audience for the questions. And um, this is the last uh, webinar of 2022. We will be back in the new year with more themes and more exciting and interesting uh, webinars. Um, we will be posting this webinar for you to come back to if you want to uh, on the YouTube channel, and we will be sending you an email as soon as that is done. And uh, I hope to see you all uh, in uh, at the next masterclasses in 2023. Thank you.